following is brought to you by Severn Christian Church, a family church where your life matters. Reading from verse 44 through 47, chapter 2. Uh, I do have my Bible up here. It's just the partial, my partial Bible. And uh, actually this, uh, I was excited about turning to this passage. Matter of fact, uh, we probably should turn to this one a lot in our Bibles, you know, Acts chapter 2. And uh, so it ripped right out of my Bible, and so I have to maybe get it fixed. But, uh, but it is the Word of God here um, that I want to share this morning, starting with verse uh, 44. This is a central passage in, in all the New Testament because... Uh, all the work that Jesus did on the cross and as he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, as he uh, put three years of his life into the apostles to prepare them for the uh, church age, which we now live in. Uh, We're here because of what happened here in Acts chapter 2. And uh, so it is central uh, that we understand this passage. It is is a guideline to grow the church in every generation. And so I pray now, as already prayed, that we'll pay attention to what God has to say this morning in this passage. And all those who had believed were together, just like us, and had all things in common. And they began selling property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as any might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, Breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Yesterday at our NPC, our prayer clinic with the men, uh, Ray Bennett preached on uh, Jonah, the three revivals of Jonah. And uh, the way he introduced the passage was that uh, back in the days of Noah, it says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness there in Hebrews, and he preached to the people as he built the ark. But all the world that heard it did not repent, and God had to flood the world. He had to judge it. He told them what was coming. And Scripture does that in every generation, doesn't it? It tells us and informs us, here's what's coming. And then in the days of Jonah, God says, go preach the gospel to the Ninevites. And the Ninevites had a huge city. It took them a whole day just to walk to almost the middle of it before he started preaching that God's wrath was going to come and destroy their country, their whole nation, their powerful nation, unless they repented before God. Now Jonah, he didn't want to do it because he hated those people. He didn't like what they represented. It's very similar to our day. There's some people we don't like. They're messing up our world. But they're rebelling against God. But this great major city of that day repented and turned to God. And there was a revival because they turned back to God. Now yesterday before the clinic started, before we heard that, I noticed that Billy Teal was looking out the window. And I thought to myself, What is Billy thinking? It would be his last prayer clinic with us. And I thought he's probably looking out the window for the last time to look upon the property. And then he's going to be with those men uh, in fellowship, his dear brothers and our dear brother, maybe for the last time in that prayer clinic. As a matter of fact, I think that's what he said. This would be the last time that he would. And I can't read his mind But I do know that Billy would want to say these very things. And I know this because after I finished this little introduction to start the sermon, he called me on the phone (laughs) as he's driving to Ohio. And I said, Billy, it's amazing that you called me because you weren't going to be there to hear what what I was going to say, so I'm going to read it to you. And he said, amen and amen and amen as I read it. And so if he was here this morning, he would. So maybe you can say the amens for Billy, because here's what I believe that he would say after 32 years of relationship and ministry with us. Elder Billy Teal would want us to make it 
He would want us to cross the finish line at the end. He would want each one of us to be part of refilling this church and building more churches in the future. He desires that we love his daughter Kelsey and feed her faith while she was with us and they're away. Billy wants Severn Christian Church to rise above its own challenges, to rise above the persecution towards the modern church today. I believe he wants us to rise above the faltering economy and the unresponsive government that we're under today. And I believe that Billy desired that each one of us would step it up. As he and Delora parts, I know and I'm confident that they will not cease to pray for us as a church for our well-being and our success. For 32 years, the Teals have shared their life with us. They've been a model of this Acts 2, 44 and 47. With all God's might, they want us to live out this passage. And God has written it and preserved it for us to have a pattern to follow as we come together each week as a church. The book of Acts is a model filled with principle, doctrine, and real life stories to direct the church in every generation, including ours. In chapter 2, it explains the birth of the kingdom age, the church age, how to be saved, and how to share the gospel. In 44 through 47, it describes and defines how the early church lived. How the church turned a Roman world upside down and changed it for the future and for all of time. Today there is a culture to change, isn't there? There's a culture that's still where we need people to stand up for the scriptures. There are three principles here that made them successful in this passage, and here's what they are. It says that they were together, day by day, house to house, eating, serving, and sharing the Word of God. It formed a family because they were together. You know, we rub off on each other and we're together, don't we? And that's what you do when you come together. That's what they did. Secondly, they had all things in common. Their possessions were common property. It says in Acts 4, 32, these words. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. This means they were sharers of their stuff. It says there they shared all their possessions with all as any would have need. These principles, when practiced today, will help the church to accomplish its mission statement. And our mission statement was already said here this morning. A family church where your life matters. The mission statement is a goal that orients and finds its authority in Scripture. These right here. When we comply to Acts, when we comply to any Scripture, God accomplishes His mission through us. Now, at the end of verse 30, 47, it said this, that God added to their number day by day. You see, Christianity is practiced every day. We don't just baptize on Sunday morning. We baptize anytime someone is ready, who's heard the gospel, and wants to comply to Scripture. One of our goals is this. 220 more souls, additions to the church by 2020. Now, you think we can do that? It will only happen as a family. It only happened as we see it in Acts 2. They were together. They shared. All things were common to them. That has an impact on society and people who are looking for God, as we'll see as we work through this. And so the first thing I want to focus on is the third principle of sharing. Sharing. On your outlines, the, the church family shared what they had. They shared what they had. All those who had been, who believed were together and had all things in common. 
And they began selling their possessions, their properties, and were sharing them with all. They were able to share with others for this reason. Because it said that all things were common property to them. No one claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. That means all were sharing. And were willing to share because what's mine is yours. You can come and borrow. Paul takes it a step further. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 6.19, Paul said, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Think about that for a second. You're not your own. For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. We don't even own our own bodies. We are common property to God, each one of us, to be used to build and prosper His kingdom. You see, we even agreed to die to ourselves, didn't we? If you go to Romans chapter 6, if you're, you're reminded there by Paul that when you were buried, you were crucified with Christ, you were united with His body, you died to the old self, your new self rose from the dead, and now we become sharers of what we have in our personal life. That's one of the hardest things to give up, isn't it? Your own personal stuff. And not only that, your own personal person. That means time for others, and that's time for yourself. And the world is always telling us to invest in ourselves, even find yourself. God says, lose yourself. Jesus said, lose yourself. You'll find eternal life. But that's the kind of attitude that God will use to meet people where they are. You see, the moment we understand that all things are from God is to be used for the prosperity of the kingdom, the sooner we begin to share. It says in Romans 12, 1, that we're a living sacrifice. That living sacrifice is when you figure out that you're not your own anymore, that we've been sold out to God for the salvation he offered through the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this quote. It reminds me of Esther Kelhoffer my mother-in-law, making points with her daughter. But listen to this. Love only grows by sharing. You can only have more for yourself by giving it away to others. You know, Esther gave a lot of love, and a lot of love surrounded her. Listen to this quote. Listen closely. Nothing is yours. It is to be used. It is to be shared. If you will not share it, you cannot use it. You see, sharing outbuilt the Roman Empire. It has outlasted all the kingdoms of men. Even our own country is falling from its place because we've left God behind. Self-centeredness divides a family, divides a relationship, and divides a whole country of people. No matter how powerful, how how ingenious we are. No matter who we think we are. The moment we become self-centered and focus our eyes on ourself, we divide and we fall. We've fallen from our trust. We've fallen from our strength and our security, from liberty and from justice in our country. You know, sharing can have a lifelong and changing effect on people. Consider this one small thing. Judy, the other day, she takes piano lessons, and her and her piano teacher have really gotten close. She says their personalities are similar. And I'm so happy for that, you know, because she comes home happy and makes me happier. And, uh, but, but it's, it's a great relationship. And, um, she had given her a pencil and, uh, uh, the pencil meant a lot. And it's a really neat looking pencil too. You know, it's amazing the design we can do nowadays just on a pencil. But anyway, the, the pencil meant more than money and, and a $20 bill to Judy. But here's why. A long time ago when she was growing up as a little girl, her mother Esther would buy packs of pencils personalized with their name on it. That same feeling of sharing comes back today as an adult. of Something that's planted a long time ago through sharing and through giving. 
sharing our homes. My mother in, uh, in her home policy, along with my grandmother who lived right next door, it's so great when your grandmother lives next door. And I was very spoiled. She made pancakes a lot. I always said that uh, she had these ceramic bowls and I'd be waking up in the morning, I'd hear clook, 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 clook. And I like to have a nickel for every bowl of pancake batter, you know, that she mixed up, you know. But see, Grandma's house was open. There was always people there, family there, friends there. Our friends could go there. It was an open book. Same at my parents' house. You see, our friends, four boys, can you imagine that? Our friends came to our house. We were Grand Central Station. And uh, it did wear the house out a little bit. It wore out the yard. Uh, we played wiffle ball, and it didn't look like a yard anymore, you know. Uh, we grew up building dune buggies and making motorcycles and mini bikes, and sometimes it just looked like a big garage there, you know. Uh, but it was a home. It was shared. It was memories. We made a lot of memories. We had uh, receptions in our house back in the day when you couldn't afford a hall. Receptions were our house. We had a little pavilion out back, a screen house we called it. And uh, we'd have all family over and have those re- wedding receptions there. And uh, by the way, they were Polish receptions. They last sometimes three days, like the whole weekend. And uh, they really knew how to, knew how to party uh, back then. And, uh, but it was at our house. And, uh, and I don't know how my mother did this, and somebody said she probably had earplugs, and I don't think they invented them yet. But anyway, she let our band practice down there. So my parents, our band practiced in our house. And uh, we had a lot of fun uh, doing that. But you know what? And we're talking about holidays and birthdays and all that. That did something to my constitution. She passed along hospitality. And so it's just natural to have people in your house and invite people into your life. That's the way you grow up. You see, this is Acts 2, 44 and 47 living. This is what God wants us to do as a family. He wants to be hospitable, invite people into our lives. That hope it happens in your home. Everything was common property to them. That made me think about Billy Teal's Quoboda tractor. And uh, it was common property. Uh, it, when I first got to our house, it was a handyman special in many, many ways. And uh, in one way, I had seven trees I had to remove. They're all around the house. Roots were growing up in the foundation and everything. And I uh, had a lot of bushes to move and everything. He let me use that tractor to, to do that. And, uh, and he helped me. And it helped build Esther's house, too. And, uh, and of, others of you have used that tractor. And it's been on this campus. I don't know how many times and how many work hours it put in. But those work hours and those times with that tractor created fellowship and closeness and and sharing. Common property. Church is supposed to use it. It makes a difference. And um, talking about common property, uh, how many of you go to the Moore shop, the Moore performance? Moore performance, okay. More of you need to go there, and I'll tell you why. When you go there, it feels like home. Doesn't it? For those of you who go there, you know, that you, it's like you, your own shop, uh, a coffee house, and a living room, just, just right there. And just talk about anything and uh, share the Lord. And his, his presence is there because these guys like to talk about it. Can your friends and neighbors and Christians borrow your stuff? Did you ever ask yourself, self, where did I leave that blue ladder? Whatever happened to that extension cord? Whatever happened to my, the saw horses and, and those paintbrushes? If you're like that, it means you must share. And by the way, if that rings a bell, bring them back, please. <laughs> I still don't know where them saw horses are. I've bought several others since then. But do you share your stuff? your tools, your car, your house. You know, some of the best memories I have is when people live in our house. Connors have lived there. Crystal lived there. You see, if Crystal wouldn't have lived in my house, she wouldn't have Matt, and then they wouldn't have Eli. See, he lived here. She lived in Carolina. She needed to get closer to this guy, and we knew that. She lived there. Chuck, man, I know him almost like a brother now. And I know a lot of his habits because he stayed in our house for a while. I'm not going to divulge any of those. but And you know what I'm so grateful for? I'm grateful for... Sorry about that. No, I told Colin not to apologize for tears. I'm not either. 
But I'm thankful for the families who shared their children with us. And I'm looking at Toby and the Grafts and Jackie. They filled a huge void in our lives because they shared their children. And not everybody shares their children. And I thank you for that. Listen to this. Hebrews 13, 16 says these words. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. Now this isn't a poem or a quote. This is the Bible saying this. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Why do you think they're pleasing? Because He uses it to build His kingdom here on earth. The family of God shares what they had in the first century. And the people found favor with them. Which means they found favor with God and He added to the church. Number two, the church family shared their lives. Mom was preparing pancakes for her sons. Kevin, five, and Ryan, three. The boys began to argue about who would get the first pancake. Their mother saw an opportunity for a moral lesson. If Jesus were sitting here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Kevin turned to his younger brother and said, Ryan, you be Jesus. We're quick when we went our own way, don't we? <coughs> the problem with this tape, you can't cough. When you have to cough. Lives. Day by day, it says, one mind. House to house. They worshiped together. They prayed together. They shared their meals. They were sharing gladness. And it says sincerity of heart in your NASB translation. It actually means with one heart. They had one heart. What an impact it must have had to have one heart and all things in common. You see, they shared their, li- they shared their, shared their lives together. Now, if you take all that activity, we can easily say, how do you have time for this? How did they have time for that? It must have been a different lifestyle. No, it wasn't. It's not a schedule. It is a lifestyle that they lived. Listen to this quote. If you have a candle, the light won't grow dimmer. If the light, if if I light your, let me say this again. I want you to listen closely. I got to listen closely myself. If you have a candle, the light won't grow any dimmer if I light yours off of mine. You see, it takes nothing away from our light to pass it on. God saved me in my, in my, out of my paganism through Christians who shared this Acts 2.46. Their light was passed on, their lifestyle. At Joppa Town, they opened their homes, they loved me, they fed me. I even gained weight during that time. They counseled me and educated me. They patiently waited and had long suffering as I had to conquer many sins in my life. So how could I ever not give back to God what they gave to me? And I think every one of us could say the same thing. How can we not give back to God when he's given so much to us through other people? Sharing life means sharing pain. They were together. And if you get close enough to people, you know that they'll go through loss, pain, sorrow, bad choices. And if we are together as they were day by day, sharing life together, we will suffer. But it's something we have to be willing to do, isn't it? I can tell you this, that I have two unbreakable relationships with two brothers in this congregation because we suffered the pain of divorce together. It has rebuilt relationships in those two fellows' lives. They're solid, solid servants for the Lord Jesus Christ because of it. 
Listen to these words. Yes, we both have a bad feeling tonight. We shall take our bad feelings, share them, and face them. We shall mourn. We shall drain the bitter dregs of mortality. Pain shared, my brother, is pain doubled, is not doubled, but halved. No man is an island. You see, the first century church, they shared their lives. Here at the church on Thursday nights, every other Thursday, first and third Thursday of the month, we have a group called the DBSA, Bipolar and Depression Support Alliance. And that's exactly what they do. They share and they care for each other in such a way that nobody else can because, see, they understand. And it's that sharing that gives them the greatest amount of support they can get anywhere else. Yes, they need doctor's care. Yes, they need proper medication. But they'll tell you the greatest support they have is each other. Sharing produces a family where everyone matters. Here in Acts 4.34, it says this, For there was not a needy person among them. Imagine all the needs we have as humanity. Imagine the persecution they were under. Imagine the rejection the early Christians faced from their own families and from the leadership and then from the oppression of the Roman Empire. And it says there was not a needy person among them. See, the church family collectively sold what wasn't necessary for others. When you see a needy person and when you rescue them, God gets the glory and often they never forget. Years ago, um, a couple of fellows and myself, and I think my uncle was with me, uh, we went and moved a family, a distant family relative. I, I didn't know this person very well. And um, there was nobody. They were isolated. There was nobody to move them. And they lived in some projects. And, um, and so we went up there and it took us all day. It was a lot of work. Nothing was packed. No organization. Just absolute depression and so we moved them and got them into their other apartment and uh you know you go there you, you, know, you don't know what you're in for you say you know you gotta you gotta praise god and you, you have to to do things in his name and uh and that's what we did every time i run into this woman she never forgets that day she was rescued she was helped really by strangers but not so much strangers. Because she praised God the whole day. She was thanking God the whole day. Because she didn't know how she was going to do it. Anytime the church, anytime you as a Christian, give food away, comfort somebody, give your time, give away your clothes for somebody else's back, pay a rent, pay for medical bills, pay for some medicine, pay an electric bill, you name it, most people never forget it. And a lot of times they pay it forward to somebody else. Remember I told you that story of Wendy's that one day going through the drive through and that kid, he just couldn't believe himself, the one that takes the orders at the window, because three people in a row paid it back. And I'll be honest with you, when I, it, when I rode away, the person behind me that I paid for, maybe they paid for it to the next person, I don't know. But all I know this kid recognized something was happening, and I told him that's what people... Uh, uh, godly people do. They share. And that's what happened. The first Christians paid forward salvation, their material possessions and blessings. They blessed others to bring them into the fold. It says there in verse 47, they had favor with all the people. You see, sharing bears fruit. People say they're giving people in a very selfish world. And that's what we live in right now. But we share, people have favor with God and with His people. God opens doors when we have an attitude of sharing. And you never know what door needs to be open. This leads to the final point, the church family shared the gospel. In chapter 8, verse 4, here's what the Bible says about that first century church. Therefore, those who have been scattered went about preaching the word 
Now they were scattered because the church came under persecution. Saul was taking people from their homes, dragging them out. Back then they called the movement the way. And if you were involved in the way, you stopped going to the temple. They say, where are you going? You're not going there. You're staying home. You're with these rebellious people of the way. We're taking you to prison. We're taking you before the magistrate. We're going to put you on trial for your faith. But it says there in Acts chapter 6, 7, the word of God kept spreading. It said in chapter 5, 14, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. In 4.4 4, it says the number of men came to about 5,000. You back up a little bit more, 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. So sharing, charity, love, when accomplished by the word or accompanied by the word, bears fruit. It says God added to the number daily those who were saved. It is a lifestyle. It is something you engage yourself in. It's not a schedule you make up. It's a life we live. That's what they did. The family grew as they went to temple. They said they went to the temple to the hours of prayer. You know why? There was people there. There was people to make contact and relationship with to begin to build a sharing life with them. They knew that their economy wasn't working. They knew that the law was perverted and didn't work. They knew they were weak in their flesh. If they were honest, they knew they needed a different life. And so temple meant they went where the people were to share. And they went house to house. They made it personal. They went to the people. They not only went to the temple, they started going to the town gates. And the town gate is where you found justice for your family. Town gate is where you found wisdom, is where you found the elders. They went to the marketplace. They went to the schools. They went to, down by the river. They went where the people were. They went with a purpose to build relationships with people to share. That's why on the church schedule, we go to the Western Police District. It's not just to feed them. It's to get acquainted with them. And it was amazing last year. If you spent any time with those officers, it was an open relationship started with us. You know how much it moved them? The next, that Monday, the next day, one day after the first day of the week, they were here at the daycare, weren't they? They came to the church. You see, we moved them by sharing. And they came. And now we rub elbows with these men and women who uh, live a dangerous life. And often they contemplate eternity in their souls. You ever hear that song, Knocking on Heaven's Door? Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Something like that. Don't quit your day job, right? But if you listen to the verses in between, it's a police officer, and he's had enough. And he wants to lay down his badge and his gun. He says, I'm not doing it anymore. Knock, knock, knocking. I feel like I'm knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. You see, they carry that around every day. You don't think they need support, especially at a time like this? But we're going to local schools. We're campusing local, local neighborhoods. We're working in the community. We're partnering with local restaurants. We're feeding the poor, housing the homeless. We're partnering with local Christian charities like House of Hope and Hope for All and Little Pregnancy Center. You see, that's rubbing elbows with people. That's what the purpose is, to share with them the faith once for all. See, they took the word house to house. Now think about this for a minute. Cultures do change, okay? We meet all kind of places, don't we? When I was growing up, I liked the Moose Lodge. We went a few times. But at the Moose Lodge, they bring out big trays of rockfish rolled up in buttered paper. Mmm, you open that up and eat that rockfish up. But anyway, they went from house to house. But how about house to house and restaurant to restaurant? Fellowship to fellowship, cookout to cookout, sports to sports. And see, in most of these, they ate together. And see, we like to eat together, don't we? But they establish relationships in those moments. I've spent hours meeting people at Friendly's, at the Grill, at Wendy's, Mickey D's and Lido's and Pizza Hut, and it goes on, doesn't it? That's where we are now. That's where you can meet people. That's where we break the ice. That's where we start a history with someone. It says here, 
they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God. No wonder people found favor with those early Christians. They really knew how to throw a love feast. They knew how to fellowship. You know, Scott said, Lankowitz said on uh, Wednesday night at the cookout, he said that we really know how to have clean fun. And that's true. That's what Christian fellowship is. Clean fun. Holy kisses. Love with sincerity of heart. One-mindedness. The world doesn't have that. They want it. They're trying for it. So they think nanny bow and sensuality is a good time. But you know that gets old. And when their life is ruined, they're still looking for a clean life. And that's what we have. You know, our Wednesday night barbecues are a perfect place to bring your friends and your neighbors. Because you hear the word, you get the fellowship, and pretty darn good stuff on the grill. You see, God's way is relational. It's in intimate places. It's in homes. It's where people get close, like family members. There are four families I'll never forget. They were the foundation of my Christianity. The Wilsons, the B-Words, the Bohms, and the McGee's. In every sense of the word and term of definition of family, that's where they were to me. Mom, you remember. Mom was six months behind me. And these people nurtured me to a higher level of Christianity. Each and every one of these families practiced the characteristic of Acts 44 through 47. You see, it's the definition of church. Now, on January 4th, 1987, not far from where I live in Dundalk, on 695, Amtrak number 94 ran through a signal, and it crashed to, through two, a set of Conrail locomotives at 108 miles an hour. Maybe some of you remember that. But it was in Chase, Maryland, right there in Baltimore County, right along 695. And uh, I saw a picture of it uh, here recently. But 14 on board were killed and an engineer and a lounge attendant as well. You see, the engineer tested positive for marijuana and served four years in prison for missing that signal. The cars pulled over on 695, and immediately people ran, because you could see the railroad tracks right there by the highway, and people pulled over and ran towards the, the trains before the first responders uh, got there, but one of them was a doctor. And uh, there were hundreds of people who were crying for help, as a train was, was zigzagged across the tracks. But the doctor and the others were just overwhelmed to help the people as they waited for the first responders. As a doctor, as a doctor did all he could for each patient, he kept saying and repeating this, if I only had my instruments, if I only had my instruments. I just wonder how God feels. When he looks around in our world, when he sees the wounded and the lost all around the church. Let's examine this morning. Let's take a look inside. As a whole family, let's examine ourselves and say, are we going in the direction God wants us to go? It's a personal thing, but it's also a church thing. We have plenty of things to sign up for, plenty of projects. When you hear them coming, sign up, get on board, share. That'll make a difference. If you're outside the Lord this morning, or if you want to place your membership here with us, this is the time as our musicians come out. And By the way, thank you for leading us today, uh, Scott, and the worship team. Uh, you guys do a great job. Appreciate it. And uh, let's stand. Stretch your bones a little bit. Get your blood flowing. Every first day of the week, every day of the week, is an opportunity to make up your mind where you're going, how you're going to get there. God's calling you to salvation. That's the ultimate place He wants to call you. It's the ultimate gift He wants to give you. It's the salvation of your soul. God didn't make it hard to understand the gospel. It starts with, do you believe this stuff? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe He's a Savior? you believe he came to the earth for that very reason 
save us from our sins so we might have forgiveness of sins. You believe he died on the cross, rose on the third day. Are you willing to change according to the scriptures? Not according to how you feel or somebody's telling you how, how to feel, how to be religious. No, but according to the scriptures, you change your life. It's called repentance. They said, don't be ashamed of me and don't be ashamed of my gospel. Be willing to confess with your mouth because if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you, you'll confess that. You'll be willing to do that. If you're willing to take those steps, and then God offers baptism. And in baptism, as I said earlier, you die with Jesus in your sins. He died for our sins. We die because we're a sinner. And there he washes away our sins because Jesus shed his blood. Without the forgiveness of sin, there's, without, the forgiveness, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And there the death of Jesus takes place in your life. God wipes away your sins opens your temple for the Holy Spirit to reside within your life. And then it says, Paul says in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, that the Holy Spirit is God's promise or pledge of your inheritance. You can't get there without the Holy Spirit. If you have a decision to make, come on down as we sing.